okay so let us start with this to, to for the, in the interest of time let us start Meet with Meet the second paper on the list hmm. uh, this is for information of the judges paper fp56 and i would like to call right away the chief and presenting author of this paper dr neera jastrani uh, to present his comparison between a new slit lamp based toric marker storm and a conventional marking technique okay good morning my name is dr neera jastrani and uh, my topic today is a novel new age toric marker versus age old toric marking so uh, there have been various innovations in toric marking right from the manual handheld toric marker such as anterior stromal puncture then the pendulum marker and the bubble marker of course automated markers on the other hand such as the app based marking callisto image guided system and the varion image guided system however we see that these are very expensive and uh, when we mark manually we see a uh, uh, axis completely off like this so uh, we wanted to actually come up with an economical accurate stable and easy to use toric marker now we took inspiration from the goldman's applination tonometer as you can see the patient is very comfortable and uh, it actually goes and indents the eye uh, at a very comfortable stage uh, we wanted to implant our marker into the calibration slot which is universal for every toric uh, every slit lamp so we came up with this idea and this was the first hand drawn diagram as you can see we further did a lot of 3d printing models and as you can see every time we 3d printed it started becoming more and more bulkier and uh, uh, we then finally settled with a shaft in a shaft design which was basically uh, as you can see this was our first prototype and as you can see in the video with the help of the knob of the slit lamp it can actually go and indent the cornea at the desirable axis so we just need to slightly avert the eye of the patient we've worked up on that also in the further model and with the help of the knob we take it back further uh, this is the final prototype as you can see the toric dial and the axis is made of a stainless steel and it has a atraumatic edge which goes and indents the cornea with the help of the blue mark it also marks the blue mark and there is a adapter with a uh, a bull's eye levelometer as it's called which is supposed to make sure that it is perpendicular to the table of the slit lamp so this is how it finally looks so we did a very simple study where we wanted to see how efficacy what is the efficacy and ac accuracy of this so we took 50 eyes uh, of anterior strobel puncture and we took 50 eyes with our marker and what we did was 50 eyes of both the group a and group b were compared to the gold standard which is varion and as you can see the same iol power calculation software was used the uh, same surgeon performed these surgeries same technique was used not only that the same machine was used also the same iol was used so as you can see the you can see the blue marks which are the marks with our toric marker and this is a varion now 126 had to be aligned varion is showing 126 degree what we did is we took a screenshot of this and we used a digital planimetry software which is paid software online this basically gives us a complete circle of even minute degree of axis and we measured the deviation of axis so we basically measured how much is our toric marker's axis away from the varion's axis we did this on 8 days 1 month and we saw that uh, so in the analysis we saw that uh with our marker the deviation was 4.69 plus or minus 1.73 the least being 1.08 degrees and with the uh, other slit lamp marking that is the anterior stromal puncture it was the least was 1.66 so slightly better with our marker we performed a biostatistician performed an independent stool sample t test which again showed p value significant with our toric marker So uh, as you can see 50 eyes with anterior stromal puncture deviation of axis approximately 4.07 degrees and with ours it was 2.96 degrees that is much lesser so hence we were able to actually come up with an economical accurate stable easy to use i would like to end with just showing the final prototype or the final device which is now available in the stalls at epsilon for everybody to try so as you can see it's very easy just put it in the calibration slot this is the bubble marker it's centered and you just put the toric marker uh, 
this also can be sterilized uh, has to be sterilized of course this is just for this thing and you just screw it up now the dial is much smaller now so the you don't even have to avert the eyelid that much just take the uh, mark the axis with the blue marker take it it actually goes in and ends the eye i will also show the markings uh, in a picture next so as you can see it marks and also slightly indents the cornea so even if after putting paracane it will not wash away this is the beauty of this marker now uh, final stage of hearing already published in uh, indian patent journal now i think hearing will be done very soon and clinical trials are still going on we want to increase the numbers and continue the studies thank you Uh, very innovative indeed, uh, Dr. Neeraj. Thank you. But uh, I have less few issues, okay? Yeah. When you sent in your uh, summary, initial summary, that was on 30 cases. Yes. And finally, when you gave the final write-up, that was on 25 cases. I mean, Again, you have presented on 50 cases, yes. but your statistics haven't changed. No, so the, the, the you know yeah. average mean remains the same. Yes, the p value remains the same. Yeah, there is a reason for that because yeah, please. Uh, first twenty five eyes was performed with the three D printed marker. Okay, and now that I have this, I have basically added those, and the the difference is almost the same. Only thing is the dial becomes smaller now. So basically, with both of them, the statistics I've tried to keep them the first statistics itself. Yes, I yes. realized that they are the original yes, statistics yes, that yes, you had sent yes, in. Yes, yes, that's right. And uh, the thing is that uh, you know uh, that it it does not need to be individualized for each slit lamp. That is also very nice to yeah. know. Uh, but I think uh, the marker has to be autoclaved repeatedly, and it being a stainless steel, is it going to you know what the calibration of that marker is it going to be affected in the long run? So there is a solution for that also. See, the entire body is made out of aluminum body, aluminum stainless steel. This does not need to be autoclaved because this can be permanently fixed on a slit lamp. This is the only thing which is detachable. This is the only thing that needs to be autoclaved. Uh, what you need to do is just once you autoclave this with the help of a chittel, uh, you can just uh, put it in this and you have to just adjust the screw. That's it. So that is the only autoclavable part. And I have been just because the video I didn't, I, I wanted to show a very raw video, but I have whenever I mark, I autoclave it and mark it, especially in pre op cases. Yeah, uh, very good initiative. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Nira. Yes, sir. You have not declared any financial interest in this presentation. Yeah. Sir, I, now I have financial <laughs> interest <laughs> because it is yeah. available in the... Uh, and though it's a, not a part of your presentation, have you compared with other markers like bubble markers and this thing? Uh, no, I have no. just compared with anterior stromal um, puncture. Okay. But yes, there are few, future, uh, as, uh, future studies will be done comparing it with other markers yeah. also. And also Makes some softwares are available on applications. On the, yeah, applications. You can compare with those also. Definitely, sir. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Neeraj. And now, with a slight change in program, I would like to call on uh, the presenting author at the end uh, for this for the information of judges, Dr. Shashwat Porwal. Uh, actually, I'm calling them in order of which, uh, you know, their presence in the hall. So this is FP666, uh, and he'll be presenting on visual outcomes after implanting 30 extended depth of focus lenses in a tertiary care center. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, my paper presentation on visual outcomes after implanting 30 extended depth of focus lenses in a tertiary care center. Uh, study design, it's a one year prospective interventional study uh, from January 21 to December 21. So a total of 30 eyes of 30 consecutive patients with cataract were selected by the inclusion criteria and were enrolled into study after taking an informed and written consent and demographic data of patients were noted in a pre-designed performer. Study was conducted in a tertiary care center in South India. Pre-operative evaluation involves a thorough ophthalmologic examination which included an assessment of their distant, intermediate and near visual acuities, refractive status, slit lamp biomicroscopy, non-contact tonometry and dilated fundoscopy. 
Snellen's charts were used to assess distance visual acuity. Snellen's reading charts were utilized to assess near visual acuity. Snow charts analyzed intermediate visual acuity. KH and KB value were taken with auto refractometer and PCL calculation were done with A scan biometry. All the patients underwent topical phaco emulsification with extended depth of focus lens implantation by a single phaco surgeon. The size of the incision was 2.2 mm and it was enlarged to 2.8 mm for IOL implantation. During post operative period, the patient was put on moxifloxacin and dexamethasone eye drops 8 times a day, moxifloxacin eye drops 4 times a day, and tropicamide phenylephrine eye drops once, once in the night for one week. Moxifloxacin eye drops and tropicamide phenylephrine eye drops were stopped after one week, and uh, the antibiotic steroids were tapered in three weeks. Post operatively, detailed examination with distance, intermediate, and near visual acuity, slit lamp examination, and fundus examination was done. The patients were asked to come for the evaluation for first day, first week, and fourth week of post operative day. Patient satisfaction evaluation was also done by visual function questionnaire at the end of the fourth week. The inclusion criteria were uh, patients with visually significant cataracts. Patients who are older than 45 with a corneal astigmatism of less than 2 diopters. The ex exclusion criteria were uh, patients with amblyopia, with neuroophthalmic diseases, with active ocular disease such as uveitis, pseudo exfoliation syndrome, glaucoma, or previous ocular trauma. Uh, the results The mean age of the participants was found to be around 62 years of age. Among them, 60% were female and 40% were male patients. The uh, comparison of the distant vision, where preoperatively most of the uh, most of the vision were less than uh, 660, uh, at one day follow-up, around 57% had a vision of 636 to 624. 63% uh, at first week had a vision of 618 to 612, and around 90% achieved a vision of 66 to 69 at one month of uh, follow-up. Uh, comparison of the intermediate visions uh, at one day, day one, 30% uh, were able to achieve a vision of 615. Uh, 624 were, uh, 624 vision was being able to achieve by 30% at first week and 63% were able to achieve, achieve a vision of a 66 at one month. The near vision N8 to N10 were achieved by 60% of the patient at day one. N8 to N10 at 86.7% at first week and first month and N6 were achieved by 26 uh, person, uh, patients at f uh, first month. At the end of the fourth week of follow-up, there were around 13% of the patients which were complaining of day glare, 27% complaining of night glare and 30% complaining of the halos. But at the end of the fourth week, uh, there were around 24% patients out of the 30 patients which were able to have a spectacle independence and overall uh, satisfaction of the patient around 77 patient uh, percent of the patient were found to be very satisfied 16% uh, uh, satisfied and 7% around not satisfied conclusion the study showed that extended depth of focus lens can be safely implanted in a patient undergoing the cataract surgery with good visual outcome Besides, no adverse effects were noted with the implantation of the IOL. The patient satisfaction showed majority were very satisfied at the fourth week of follow-up. Yeah, so only 74% of the patients were satisfied. That means 26% were unsatisfied. Yes, sir. So what was the reason? It's very high number, actually. Sir, because uh, uh, majority of the people thought the, there was a decrease in the contrast sensitivity and they were while driving and in the night they were complaining of the glare so how so, did you check the contrast sensitivity did you do that sir uh, was it checked uh, before surgery after surgery sir, was it in comparison uh, sir before surgery uh, i checked it after the surgery at how was point. it checked so with logmar contrast i it was done in yes, the sir. Studies. so they and had less contrast sensitivity even after less, the surgery 
so most of the patient if there were vision is only uh, see a 1 meter 2 meter then i was not able to check Correct. but that was pre operatively uh, uh, post operatively uh, post operatively with logmar contrast see most of the patients had vision of so low vision and they those patients gaining vision and in spite of that the satisfaction level is less yes sir isn't that something sir, which is because, alarming yes sir because uh, the uh, when when i did the cardio i was told ki the you will get the same vision as it was the near you will get the near vision you'll get the distance and the intermediate but along with that there was lot of glare problems uh, patients faced and hello problems so in your study the conclusion is that whether the patients were happy or not happy so what is your opinion around 75% patients were happy sir yeah. so It's a very less It's number. It's a very less, less number, number, I feel. Yeah. If you are doing cataract surgery with preoperative vision only counting fingers or maybe counting fingers one meter or two meter, and of all that said, if only seventy five percent of the patients are happy, that means most of them are not happy. That's what I feel. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. so unhappy is a big number. Yeah, it's a big number. How did you assess the glare and halos? Was it only subjective? Oh, like subjective. It. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shashwat. And uh, now I would like to call upon Dr. Anu Paul, who was present uh, before you. Sorry, sub JG, sir, for keeping you waiting. Uh, this is FP five four five evaluation of skills transfer in short term MSICS training program using ICO Oscar. Good morning, everyone, respected judges and dear delegates. Today, I am presenting evaluation of skill transfer in short-term manual small incision cataract surgery training program using ICO Ophthalmology Surgical Competency Assessment Rubrics ICO Oscar. Yes. The authors have no financial interest to disclose. MSICS is a widely accepted, cost-effective, and affordable technique, which is shown to yield similar surgical outcomes as vaco emulsification. Surgical training requires standardized curriculum and a well-structured program. Earlier studies were concentrated more on the subjective analysis of trainee surgical performance by a preceptor or a mentor. The focus has now shifted to more objective assessment of the surgical competence, uh, mainly by tools like ICO Oscar SICS, which is internationally valid and re reliable tool, which is used in this study. Methodology: It was a retrospective observational study carried out from June 2019 to May 2022 at a tertiary care eye hospital in South India. A total of 95 trainees were evaluated during one month MSICS training program using ICO Oscar scoring. The trainees were divided into three groups. The first year residents consisted of 17 trainees. The, uh, they were the first year postgraduates without no prior MSICS experience. Second group was the fellows. Uh, 64 trainees were enrolled in this group, and they are the post residency surgical. Training uh, trainees in the institute, lasting of 1.5 to 2 years and having varying previous MSCS experience. The third group was external trainees, 13 trainees. These are practicing ophthalmologists from other centers, having varied MSCS experience and who are an enrolled in the surgical training program for one month. This one month program is a dedicated surgical skill transfer program which involves uh, hands-on MSCS training along with wet lab training, operating uh, OT observation, lecture classes, and one-on. one to one discussion sessions on msacs patients having age related nuclear cataract grades 2 to 3 with pupillary dilatation of cyanomum and prominent eye were selected for the study all complicated cataracts and non case of glaucoma corneal or retinal pathologies were excluded patients with deep socket systemic high risk patients and patients with post scleral abnormalities were also excluded All trainees performed MSICS with eye oil implantation under subtenance anesthesia under continuous observation by the trainer through his observer uh, eyepiece and a display monitor. If the trainee noted any difficulty in any of the steps, it was rectified by the trainer so that the trainee could proceed to the next step without uh, compromising the patient's safety. Any major intraoperative complications like scleral dissection, premature entry, post capsule rupture, and zonular dialysis were managed by the trainer. All trainees maintained a surgical logbook with ICO Oscar scoring sheet. The scoring sheet was duly filled in by the trainer after completion of each case and complications if any were also noted and discussed with the trainee. The data entered on the scoring sheet was evaluated for surgical skill by calculating the average mean scores and improvement in the mean scores in last 5 cases as compared to their first 5 cases. The scores in the first and last 5 cases were considered as the initial and end mean scores respectively. This is an example of a, a scoring ICO sheet which is used in the study. 
results a total of 1842 surgeries were done by the trainees mean age of the trainee was uh, 32 years average number of 19 surgeries was done by a single trainee in one month period each case was divided into 18 steps as per the ico oscar grading and in the study prolapse of nucleus into anterior chamber and nucleus delivery was marked as a single step maximum score of 5 per step and total maximum score of 90 per case was given uh the table one shows the difference in the initial and end training scores uh the first year residents showed statistically significant improvement in scores from the initial to end mean scores uh to start with the first year residents had very low me initial mean sco uh, score and this was statistically uh, significant and towards the end all the three groups uh, had no difference in uh, statistically different uh, difference in the mean scores Uh, the learning curve uh, was evaluated by plotting the mean scores in set of five consecutive cases and observing its trend it is uh, evident from the figure the blue line shows the first year residents they had a um, increase in uh, mean scores starting from the beginning of the course itself and the fellow group which is shown in the red line they had an initial uh, high scores and they maintained their plateau curve the external trainees also had a high initial score and uh, the graph increased towards the Uh, end of the training uh, capsular access and uh, tunnel construction are two important steps in cataract surgery so it was seen that the first year residents had a statistically significant improvement in scores uh, from the beginning to the end of the training uh, considering the tunnel construction all the three groups had some improvement in the scores but it was not reaching statistical significance complication observed in the study in the groups uh, the most common complication uh, in all the three groups were in tunnel construction especially in as premature entry and uh, the external training group had the highest uh, number highest rate of posterior capsule rupture and zonular dialysis whereas the first year residents had the least of pcr and zonular dialysis come to discussion surgical skill assessment is necessary to know the progress made by the trainees and to improve the training program as well several tools were used in the previous studies like oasis grasses and surgical video assessment for the same so ico oscar sics provides an objective benchmark for comparative purposes the lower mean scores of first year residents can be attributed to their lack of prior msics experience but showed significant improvement in the learning curve during the one month the difference in the mean scores between the groups significantly reduced towards the end of training this shows that a training a proper structured training can help the trainees without any prior msics experience uh, to be at par with those who had experience tunnel construction and capsular access contribute significantly the surgical learning curve and complication most common complication made by first year residents were in tunnel construction 3.3% external trainees had higher rate of pcr and zd previously acquired improper skills and that required unlearning and relearning the ideal technique could be the reason conclusion short term one month msics skill transfer program is efficient and significant especially for novice surgeons and ico oscar is a uh, useful tool for assessment of skill transfer thank you sir thank you dr yeah. anu Then thank you madam for the nice presentation now you have talked about the common complication the premature entry yes, yeah. all blades given for every case were disposable or there is no nothing like sometimes it is third time four time where well, that uh, makes a lot of variation in the yes sir it was know. disposable uh, blades uh, crescent was used so every case was given a new disposable blade yes, of the same company yes sir even all company right. also it makes a difference yes sir yes i now when the outside fellows came for training yes, initially there is some deterioration when yes, subsequent five cases of study yes, any specific reason and then suddenly there is jump between fourth and fifth case oh yes sir uh, we analyzed uh, you mean any specific reason or there are tens in your operating in your institute for the first time <laughs> maybe uh, they are getting used to the environment actually yes, ah, because every every ot environment can be different now so ah, other trainees is. were used to your institute that might be a probable reason uh, by any chance i think you are in a big institute uh, any surgical simulator is there in your uh, institute yes sir hmm. you are from arvind yes sir ah correct okay. well that so gives a very nice simulator uh, yes sir okay yeah. it gives a very nice analysis of the Yeah, uh, case, that is the, a different thing. Especially for the uh, beginners, sir, uh, those who have not done uh, hands-on on human eye, they get a very good um, um, that intraocular spatial orientation and uh, tissue uh, feel with the feel. tactile. Tactile feeling, tactile feeling is yes, there. Sir. And uh, one more question, which is not a part of your paper. Yes, sir. You must be giving training for phaco emulsification also. Yes, sir. On an average, who learns faster? Phaco is learned faster or SSS? 
sir uh, personally i feel uh, if you have a very good uh, experience with mscs it is a very short learning curve for fake emulsification no no for uh, the raw patient for the raw raw student. raw student raw student so would you i mean the basic question would be would you allow a raw student who does not know ssas to learn yeah. fake or right away yeah. and how would your icu asker be helping in that one okay sir so, No. I have asked this question to many institutes. No, and abroad actually say, they don't train if MSICS. They yeah. just directly train uh, fake. 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 So can we compare? You can yeah. make a two groups of students. Yeah. One you uh. throw them for directly for fake, uh. and yes, second sir. for. It's not a part of this yeah. study, yeah. but I'm just asking. Maybe in the future. Your experience in the institute. institute yes, I think that's a very. Uh, uh, I asked this question to many institutes. They yes, say. Sir. Fake is learn faster. Mm. The reason being, there are so many fake masters everywhere in India and abroad. You. Uh, get to see lot of with good videos, yes, lot of good training programs are there. Yes, sir. there are very few SICS expert surgeons, though SICS yes. is commonly done. Yes, so it is a painful learning curve for MSICS. Yes. And FACO is comparatively easy. Complication chances are very less. Yes. All our FACO masters they have done lot of complications in their learning stage mm -hmm. because for them nothing was there for learning. Okay. But all these youngsters they do minimal complications in FACO now. Sir, from my on the contrary, MSICS is uh, very painful in learning. Yes, uh, from my small experience, what I feel like uh, is FACO is more of a machine. Dependent, whereas MICS is more of a skill, skill and uh, yes. hands-on. It's required. Sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you. our Gen, Gen Z is more tech savvy. I think that is one thing. They are more tech savvy. They are more so tech savvy. See what happens in FECO. We are worried about the endothelium because of FECO energy. Yes, but now they know the good techniques, so that damage also Even is not there. The machines are very. But in MSICS, if you don't respect endothelium, it is very common. The coronary gets complicated, and MSA is unnecessary. Then carries bad name. Definitely, sir. Simco versus IA. Manual versus that makes a difference. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Anu, for thank that you, presentation. And uh, now I would like to call upon Dr. J. Gopal Agarwal uh, for his paper FP five six seven on new trend of artificial intelligence based IOL power calculation is superior to regression formula. Good morning to everybody. My topic is the new trend of artificial intelligence-based IOL power calculation is superior to regression formula. I have no financial interest. Now, the purpose of this study is to compare the accuracy of widely used IOL power calculation formulas, including the artificial intelligence formula. We have three formulas for the artificial intelligence: is the Hill RBF, Lada Super, and the Kane. And here in this study, we compare the other uh, regression formula, especially the Barrett, Olson, and EVO. How does artificial intelligence formula works? When we upload the data of a patient, artificial intelligence-based formula finds a distinct pattern in the apparently random cloud of data points already created in large number of cases, based on the pattern recognition of artificial intelligence. Thus, it is purely data-driven IOL calculation approach. Therefore, it is free from the limitation of expected lens position, and also free from the limitation of the internal inherent of standard formula. It is adaptive, dynamic, and the continuously evolving. Pre-operative investigation was done by IOL Master 700, and the readings were used, and along with the complete examination of the eye, the patient was distributed in the groups. Group one is axial length more than 24.5. A uh, group two is 21.5 and 24, uh, 21.5 and the 24.5. And group three is less than 21.5. One month post operative by the, the same professional, same auto refractor instruments are measured, and we uh, calculated the best corrected visual acuity, post operative acu actual power, adaptive uh, power, and number of adaptive errors. It is a retrospective studies and detail of 423 eyes are, uh, are taken in this study. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria of my study. These are data collected from the, uh, all the patients and it is uh, uh, all formulas, yeah, it is the power calculated from all formulas and lastly what we have got the post-operative result. The mean were shown in the mean is means and standard deviation, refractive mean numerical error and mean absolute error of IOL formula different axial length group are calculated and compared. Refractive error of absolute value in percentage by each formula is calculated as 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 1 and 2 diopters. Mean absolute error is used as the indicator of IOL formula prediction accuracies. A small standard deviation of mean 
एब्सोल्यूट एरर शोज दैट एक्यूरेसी ऑफ प्रोडिक्शन इज गुड दिस इज डेमोग्राफिक एंड प्री ऑपरेटिव बायोमेट्रिक ऑकुलर पैरामीटर द पेशेंट इन स्टडी इट इज शोज दैट द मीन न्यूमेरिकल एरर एट साइड शोज द मीन न्यूमेरिकल एरर फॉर द आर्टिफिशियल इंटेल बेस फॉर्मूला आर वेरी लो same is when the mean absolute error is uh, calculated here also shown that the mean absolute error for the uh, artificial base based formula are very low here the sensitivity of the formula of its prediction error of 0.25 0.51 and two diopters here again the uh, artificial intelligence based formula gives the minimal post operative error with more eyes within the 0.5 diopter of a spher spherical equivalent the same thing is shown in, in the tabulated form here the also the mean absolute form is is the smallest when the artificial intelligence based formula is used and the, uh, it is more i is 0.5 diopter at least uh, a spherical uh, equivalent is 7.72.66 as compared to the other formula for extreme eyes also the artificial intelligence based formula is better than other formula because here the mean absolute error for or of absolute even we absolute uh, artificial intelligence based formula is used is the smallest both for the long eye and the short eye when the toric calculation and the post or classic calculation are done the for the toric calculation part when the artificial intelligence based formula is uh, we have used for the spherical part only and the barrett toric calculator for the cylindrical part if we do both are mixed then we get the very good result and the post classic calculation there is no artificial intelligence based formula till now Now use the uh, issue of astigmatism is, is compared by the centroid distribution astigmatism prediction error here again it is shows that when artificial intelligence based formula along with the barrett toric calculator if added with uh, it gives the very good result here again it is the edge over the barrett toric calculator it is same thing is shown in the uh, double angle plot graph here again the artificial intelligence based formula along with the barrett toric calculator gives the very good results in the latest uh, study also uh, the, uh, by the chang in the journal of refractive surgery here again the artificial intelligence based formula is very good especially the kens to conclude the advantage of artificial intelligence based formula is the single answer to any iwl calculation query it is totally data driven artificial intelligence based pattern recognition without estimation of expected lens position actually the expected lens position is the main problem for the for the calculation of the accurate calculation of the iwl power so those uh, formula which <coughs> there is free from the limitation of expected lens position is good though barrett formula is very commonly studied here the calculation of expected lens position is inbuilt and accurate it is important to use newer formula that is olesen can and the artificial intelligence formula artificial intelligence formula is continuously evolving thus giving more and more accurate and the accuracy is more than 90% and it will be gradually go on increasing because it is continuously evolving artificial intelligence formula being the game changer of is a grand master of biometry please thank conclude you. thank you for your kind attention okay thank you for a nice presentation sir I want to ask that uh, how many of the cases had extreme were extremes of eyes in yes, your study? Yes, it is very important question because in extremes of eye, eye that is uh, more uh, short eyes along. Yeah, how many eyes. were there in your study? Yes. How many eyes were there in your uh, study it, which it, were it, extremes? It, it is almost twenty six or twenty seven eyes. What was that? Yeah, were they high myopia yes, or if, if you compare high hyperopia? No, no, sir. In your study, let's talk about your study. You have presented case of seven hundred and some cases, and there was some exclusion criteria also. Yes. So, what were your exclusion criteria? Huh. What were your exclusion criteria? No, any other pathology of the eyes, and if there is any problem in, during the uh, operation. these are the my our exclusion criteria no no this is a pre operative study right yes. so exclusion criteria means to select a patient for that study which patients you excluded without any pathology it is very clear okay. cut cases and okay. uh, uh, there is no other so problem so you took all the patients who had all the axial lens let's yes. say from right from 20 mm till yes, say yes. 28 mm yes. all were yes. so there were some 26 such eyes yes 
and in those eyes you found that your uh, artificial intelligence based formula was yes, the best it is better because even the barrett turing barrett calculator is not so much accurate than the leda super or hill rbr okay and recently the keynes formula is better than the, any other formulas okay because yeah. it is uh, free from the expected Real position people. okay okay thank you sir thank you sir and now i would like to next call upon dr hriday mohan uh, for his paper fp447 clean sweep a novel hydro dissection technique for cortico capsular adhesions shall i start sir shall i start Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Shridhya Mohan, and today I'll be presenting my topic: Clean Sweep, a novel hydro dissection technique for cortical capsular adhesions. I have no financial interest. It was in 1992 that Fine published the first and definitive description of effective subcapsular hydro dissection in a clinical setting, calling it cortical cleaving hydro dissection. This technique can have several variants, such as single or multilamellar or multi-quadrant. Cortical capsular adhesions are firm attachments between the anterior lens capsule and the cortex. Unlike cortical cataract, there is no clear space between the cortical opacity and the capsule, as described by Dr. Vasavada et al. and shown in the diagram. They can be classified so as anterior, posterior, or equatorial based on their location. A careful preoperative slit lamp examination in dilated pupil in forward and extreme gazes help in diagnosis. Intraoperatively, a furry, moldy epinuclear surface is diagnostic. Cortical capsular adhesions can be a snag in phaco surgery. In eyes with equatorial cortical capsular adhesions alone or in combination, nucleus rotation is difficult or not possible. This may be the result of the typical failure of the normal hydrodissection wave to travel in the furnaces of the lens and against the mechanical rotational forces because of its peripheral location. Excessive force used for rotation can cause zonal damage. It is associated with longer duration of surgery and increased perceived stress by the operating surgeon. In, uh, when we review the literature, previous studies by Vasavda et al. recommend judicious combination of multi-quadrant and focal hydrodissection to cleave these adhesions. Multi-quadrant hydrodissection was performed using right and left Binkos J-shaped cannulas in these studies. And when required, focal hydrodissection was also performed at the site of the cortical opacity. Clean sweep hydrodissection is a novel technique. Here, once the capsular rexus was completed, two side cortical cleaving hydrodissection was first performed with visualization of the posterior fluid wave followed by nucleus decompression. This is followed by clean sweep in order to break the cortical capsular adhesions. Here, the cannula, the same cannula that's used for cortical cleaving hydrodissection, is placed one to two millimeters under the rexus margin and moved in a sweeping fashion with controlled injection fluid in the areas of the cortical capsular adhesions. There is concomitant mechanical debridement of the leathery adhesions during the stroking movement of the blunt cannula. This combination of kinetic fluid wave and mechanical chafing helps in breaking the CCA. This is a surgical demonstration. In sweeping hydrodissection technique, first a regular hydrodissection is done at 6 and 12 o'clock positions with nucleus decompression. This is followed by a sweeping movement of the blunt dipped cannula under the anterior capsular rim in the areas of adhesion with simultaneous minimal fluid irrigation. There is also simultaneous mechanical debridement of the adhesions using the blunt dipped cannula. This procedure is repeated in all the areas of cortical capsular adhesion in a sweeping pattern. You can see that following a sweeping hydrodissection, the nucleus rotation is relatively easy with minimal or no zonal stress. And as I radiate the nucleus, the leathery area of cortical capsular adhesion is evident. This is followed by a regular phaco emulsification procedure. The advantages of sweeping hydrodissection technique are easy nucleus rotation and cortex aspiration, minimizing zonal stress. 
there is no additional instrumentation required. There is no risk of capsular excess block as the fluid wave injection is controlled and it doesn't pass posteriorly during the brisk sweeping motion. And there is also mechanical debridement of the adhesions. Clean sweep was performed in 35 patients with CCA, diagnosed preoperatively on slit lamp examination. Patients with small pupils were excluded. FACO emulsification was performed by a single surgeon. Clean sweep hydrodissection was performed in all patients and the surgeon graded the effort required for nucleus rotation after clean sweep as easy, difficult or not possible. Forceful rotation of an adherent nucleus was not attempted for the fear of zonular dialysis. Nucleus rotation was possible following clean sweep in 34 of 35 patients. Chopping and nucleus emulsification was initiated in the patient in whom rotation was not possible. And following clean sweep, rotation effort grading was easy in 32 of 34 patients and difficult in two cases with dense equatorial and posterior adhesions. The ease of rotation corresponded with the type and extent of the CCA. Conclusion. To conclude, clean sweep is an effective technique in breaking corticocapsular adhesions and this technique requires no additional instrumentation and it helps in reducing zonalist stress during nucleus rotation. These are my references. Thank you. Yeah, nice video presentation actually, Thanks. but anything, any, you tell me the thing which is new in this. Um, actually sir, uh, when I... Uh, when I get a case of cortico dense corticocapsular adhesion, I find it a little scary actually. Um, like multi quadrant hydrodissection, uh, I feel that it can cause a lot of fluid trapping behind. And you can always tap the nucleus and yeah. drain the erasing fluid. <laughs> Definitely, sir. And one advantage that I felt with sweeping hydrodissection is that uh, when we sweep the cannula, the adhesions kind of get dislodged. So, uh, in other cases, when we do multi quadrant, the detachment is always there. So, while cortex aspiration, unknowingly, we might pull the bag, thinking that it is like cortex. But once you debride it, that area is kind of clear and the cortical opacity becomes very clear. So, that, that accidental pulling of bag can be avoided. If the zonules are weak, will you do this? No, sir. Like, uh, I. <coughs> I didn't attempt too much. The effort that was put in for rotation was only minimal. Like excessive forces were not used in order to avoid zonal dialysis. And pre-existing uh, like uh, weak zonules, phacodonosis cases, I didn't choose. Sir. Okay. Which hydrodissection cannula you used? Uh, the usual yes, blunt-tipped cannula, sir. No, blunt tip means opening it is at the tip. <laughs> yes, sir. Opening okay. at it. Do so any prefer hard fine scannula yes. which has got an oblique opening on the yes. concave side? Okay, sir. So that touches the capsule and it, it is said that it does the hydrodissection in a better way. Mm -hmm. okay, sir. Gauge of the cannula? Sorry? 27 gauge cannula. Okay. Dr. Reena Sethi, you want to present cases? Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to call upon Dr. Reena Sethi for her presentation paper FP41 on risk retrospective analysis of the hold the door technique of pinch, grasp and hold CCC. And uh, Dr. Sahiban Sabara. Okay. Dr. Aditya Sethi is presenting in, on her behalf. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, Dr. Dina, unfortunately, could not be here. Uh, Dr. Aditya, yeah. before you begin, I would like to inform you that because a change of uh, presenter is really not allowed, yeah. so we, we would be marking you, but I do not think that it would be that, considered. That's, that's fine. It's fine with you? That's fine. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. So, um, this is a... a novel twist to something which is regularly done. Uh, this is a retrospective analysis of a technique uh, called the hold the door, uh, which is a pinch grasp and hold of the CCC. So um, capsular excess we know is a critical step in cataract surgery and involves creating a round centered and continuous curvilinear opening in the anterior lens capsule. Success of cataract surgery often depends on the effectiveness and safety of this uh, procedure. Traditional CCC, we generally do manual tearing of the capsule using forceps or cystrome, and it can be of often inconsistent and uh, challenging, especially in complicated cases. So uh, we've had uh, latest techniques like Flax and Zepto, which has been developed to improve precision and safety of uh, capsular excess, which uh, has often been talked about, especially in complicated cases. However, they require additional instrumentation and not always are available or affordable in all settings everywhere. 
so came the invent of hold the door technique uh, actually it started with the intimacy in cataract where we thought this would be a little twist to what we normally did and it made a lot of sense uh, so in this the ccc um, what we do is we aim to achieve a repeatable round capsular access using basic standard cataract surgery instruments so uh, what we did is a retrospective analysis. We we had three surgeons. Uh, we uh, got their uh, data of varying surgical experiences. So there was no uh, surgical expertise bias uh, in this study. We had about 350 cases. We categorized them into regular, which is something like an NS2 or a PSC or basic uh, cataracts, routine cataracts. We also got a bunch of hard cataracts, which are no glow or which were more difficult to do this procedure in. And we also had complicated like intermittent anterior plaque, small pupil those we categorize separately so uh, we basically gave everybody seven cases uh, where we trained them on this technique uh, that we let that be the first seven cases that they performed in the uh, center uh, we measured the circularity diameter of rexis with image software and we had about uh, 200 routine cataracts that we categorized 80 uh, the hard cataracts uh, complicated cataracts were about 70 and this was demand uh, this was uh, in, amongst all three surgeons the surgeon received uh, the basic first First seven cases which are taken out um, and safety outcomes were evaluated and uh, uh, post uh, their procedures so results were we had a high success rate of close to 99.5 percent of uh, getting a repeatable uh, round rexis uh, in routine cataract success rate was 99.5 percent with a mean circularity index of 0.96 uh, and a mean diameter of 5.56 which is achieved in these uh, cases hard white cataracts the success rate was about 98.75 and circularity index was a 0.94 and diameter was about 5.51 which was achieved complicated cataracts the success rate dropped a little to 97.14 and mean circularity index was 0.92 and diameter was 5.45 the incidence of intraoperative complications was low and it was comparable to that of a traditional CCC. In routine cataracts, the incidence of uh, posterior capsule was uh, rupture was about 0.5, runout was 0.5%, ZD was 0. Hard white cataracts, the runout went up to 1.25%, um, posterior capsule rupture again 1.25%, and zonal diagnosis 0.5%. And in complicated, we had a higher rate of PCR, 2.8%, and ZD was uh, less than 1. <laughs> So in discussion, it was simple, effective, and efficient. Uh, hold the door technique um, was very easily adopted by all these cataract surgeons without the need of additional instrumentation or training. Technique showed a high success rate and repeatability in routine, hard, complicated cataracts. So in com uh, complicated cataracts where this really matters, it can be challenging, risky um, uh, in these situations. Hold the door technique showed a success rate of 97.14% and low incidence of PCR uh, and ZD and run out. Uh, these uh, results were comparable to those what FLAX and Zepto reported and superior to those where traditional CCC was uh, reported in complicated cataracts. So these are various articles which have been published in favor of Zepto and FLAX and uh, there was one very nice article I found where we compared uh, these techniques with the uh, CCC and it said that CCC fracture was superior to that of flax. Uh, selective laser capsulotomy which was uh, more highly more stronger uh, uh, type of uh, CCC and uh, this also said that there were often incomplete laser cuts and uh, this needed staining and often needed to be managed with the CCC after that. So in simple terms but just by holding the door we have managed to do a great uh, a procedure uh, safe and effective and repeatable without adding extra instrumentation so in conclusion uh, i'll just show the video because this is a surgery based let's see if i can forward this oh, it's there only can i get if the you video? can uh, have the video yeah it's not is it running it's it's likely to run we just one second take. sorry we have to. can i get the video separately so i can forward it Slide share be kanamari. Okay, I'll have to stop this. Is it? All right. So uh, by not uh, by nicking first or by not holding the door, we often have runouts, and. Uh, this is what we saw that there was raised intraocular pressure which basically happens in intermittent cataracts and that can cause uh, extra problems and as soon as you make a nick you end up 
causing tearing and argentinian flag sign would like to have your technique you yeah, know demonstrate writing that yeah. somehow i can't forward it okay. my job was just to show you okay, the technique okay okay no, uh can i stop this and show the video isko band kar ha can you see my screen? okay perfect so i'll be able to show you the technique here just show us the technique yes. in very brief so uh yeah, that's what we're interested yes yeah okay so the idea is to pinch grasp turn and then hold it till you get a circular axis wherever you can and then you can come up so in slow motion what we are trying to do is with the same instrument we are pinching we are grasping the anterior capsule so this is often been done but the idea here is to hold it and round it so once you do that there is no way that the axis runs out and then you can take breaks you can come out uh, you can get your ovds back in if required or you can continue as per your uh, fluctuation so i'll show this in certain so another case where you had intumescent leaky white so as long as you're not fluctuating you're holding if you round it and then you have a safe ccc there after a routine safe ccc there after okay sir thank you thank you yeah. i think we get the gist and uh, with that of course uh, you are not being marked for this yes for this, uh, and now i would like to call on uh, dr manpreet manpreet kaur um, for a presentation on fp205 and the topic being long term assessment of pcil optic adherence and ndr capsulotomy rate of surface modified ir a very good morning to all of you so i'll be presenting our work on long term assessment of posterior capsule intraocular lens optic adherence and its impact on ndr capsulotomy rate after implantation of a hydrophobic acrylic ile with ozone surface modification there are no financial disclosures so intraocular lenses surface modifications various techniques have been implant, uh, employed such as surface coating covalent grafting plasma treatment photochemical immobilization the purpose is to enhance the bio compatibility of the il and reduce the incidence of posterior capsular opacification so a new aspheric hydrophobic acrylic il with posterior surface modification uv ozone treatment was evaluated the mechanism of the il is that there is an increased adhesion of fibronectin and lens epithelial cells to the posterior il surface which promotes the il adhesion to the posterior lens capsule and prevents pco so we wanted to assess the pcil optic adherence in surface modified il and its impact on nd yeah capsulotomy rate and visual quality it was a prospective interventional study conducted at dr rajendra prasad center for ophthalmic sciences aims new delhi 93 eyes with immature senile cataract grade 2 to 4 were implanted with hydrophobic acrylic il with posterior surface ozone treatment after phaco emulsification cases with ocular or systemic comorbidities were excluded the primary outcome measure was posterior capsule adhesion to the il optic as assessed using anterior segment optical coherence tomography and the ndr capsulotomy rate secondary outcome was visual quality assessed using ray tracing aberrometry follow up was performed on post operative day 1 1 and 2 years so the mean age of patients was 59.46 plus minus 9.14 years 37 were bilaterally implanted 19 were unilaterally implanted no case had any intraoperative posterior capsular rent or vitreous loss at 2 years 94.6% had an uncorrected distance visual acuity corrected distance visual acuity of 2020 or better and 100% had cdva of 2032 or better So this is what we observed on ASOCT. On the left hand side, there's a case with a complete PC optic adhesion at two years. So initially, the configuration of the PC was smooth. There was a 497 microns distance between the IL optic and the posterior capsule, which decreased. to 80 microns at 1 year and at 2 years there was a complete pcil adhesion 
In this second case, there was a wavy configuration of the posterior capsule with around 255 microns fluid. It decreased to 137 microns at one year, but the fluid persisted even at the end of two years. 96 microns was left. So on post-operative day one, only 2.9% cases had complete PC to IL optic adherence. At one year, this figure increased to 67.6% and at two years, 73.5% had complete PC IL optic adherence. That means nearly more than one fourth cases was still did not have complete adherence. So Zhu et al had evaluated PC optic adhesion in visual axis after phaco emulsification and what they observed was that 41.5% had complete inhadhesion at one day and 7.1% at two months. So as per them, 93% at two months had complete adherence. However, they used stream plug imaging, which is less sensitive than anterior segment optical coherence tomography, and it may have underestimated the real incidence of PC optic inhadhesion. So why is it important? The residual PC optic distance positively correlated with the total higher order aberrations with a Pearson correlation co coefficient of 0.4 and a p-value of 0.03. So strain ratio modulation transfer function and root mean square total aberrations were significantly better in cases with complete PC optic adhesion. Coming to posterior capsular opacification, it developed in 7.5% cases at two years. So this is just an instance of a peripheral PCO with clear visual axis. 92.5% did not have any PCO. What's important is that in the 7.5% cases that developed PCO, 85.7% had persistent PC optic non-adhesion with a p-value of 0.001 and NDR capsulotomy was needed in 3.2% of cases. These had PCO obscuring the visual axis and all cases that required laser capsulotomy had persistent PC optic non-adhesion. So to conclude, surface modified IELTS are expected to have higher rates of PC optic adhesion with less PCO. Nearly two thirds of cases at one year and three fourths of cases at two years have complete PC optic adhesion. However, a quarter of cases still have persistent PC optic in adhesion and complete PC optic adhesion leads to less posterior capsular opacification rates, superior visual quality and no need for nd -YAC laser capsulotomy. This was the first study to characterize PC optic adhesion using high definition ASO city in a surface modified hydrophobic acrylic IL and correlated with visual quality and nd -YAC rates. Thank you for a patient hearing. Yeah, excellent, excellent study, something new. Uh, I have few questions actually. Have you compared uh, those lenses, hydrophobic lenses versus these lenses, adhesion rates? This is out of the study. I'm just asking yes, out yes. of this thing. Yeah. That I have not presented. Yeah, but just out of yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they have the comparison which we have done, which we yes. are also writing. They have a much better PC optic adhesion rate. On day as one. As compared to this. On day one. Uh, is it compared to that Zoo et al. which says that almost 40% on day one and 90% by no. one month? significantly more the inhibition is significantly more than as reported by zoo et al uh, they because of the you cannot compare oranges with apple plug with yeah, sheep correct, plug is yeah. very gross sir. 80 correct, microns 70 yeah. microns you don't see on that but hydrophobic are better adhered uh, to the pc at the than end of two this years surface modified yes so what's the rate uh, have you compared at two it years or? this is coming nearly more than 25 percent still had in adhesion in hydrophobic at one year around 80 to 85 percent had complete adhesion right. and two years almost all had complete adhesion the second question is you have done bilateral surgery also yes sir. so have you noticed any difference in the laterality like say for left eye more pco than right eye this is out of my experience i'm asking and i have asked this question to many surgeons uh, it's an interesting thought. We can analyze you can implement it, it. Yeah, yeah. Implement because we it. have the CPs of all. I'll try to see if I can yeah, find because something. Because what I have observed over the last 15, 20 years is I get more PCO in left eye. Okay. And okay. Uh, I am doing superior FACO. Okay. So you can just compare. Maybe you can. Okay. You're a right-handed surgeon or a I'm a right-handed right surgeon. Yeah. Okay. For a right-handed surgeon, uh -huh. more PCO in left okay. hand. With a superior. Approach. With a superior. Okay. Approach. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Can you help a general ophthalmologist who doesn't have ASOCT? Sir. Um, for the assessment of the. For PCOs. assessment, clinically you can see. You can see. Yes. Okay. On a slit lamp, you just have to make a fine slit. 80 micron, 60 micron. Will you be able to pick up in all cases? I'm not really no. sure. Okay. But gross inhibition, you can see the wrinklings, etc. Wrinklings. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
and what is the cause of fluid uh, between the posterior surface of the lens and the posterior capsule is it the fluid which remains what is that uh, any difference in surgical technique which you have noticed no difference in surgical the technique the surgeon is the same the surgeon technique is, is the same machine is same series. single surgeon series single surgeon series yes interesting interesting yeah thank no, you Uh, thank you, Dr. Manpreet. And now I think we can have another presentation by uh, Dr. Raki R. Kuroop. Again, uh, Dr. Raki, before inviting, would like to, to inform you that uh, you are a non-ratified member, so your paper will not be marked by the judges. So her paper is FP91. In the interest of science, we'll be hearing her. Influence of pupil dilatation on ocular parameters and its impact on IOL power calculation formula. Good morning, respected dyes and uh, audience. Today I am presenting the influence of pupil dilation on ocular parameters and its impact on various intraocular lens power calculation formulae. Introduction the, In the current scenario, owing to the soaring expectations of the patient, the acceptable threshold for refractive error post cataract surgery has lowered. One of the most important pillars on which achieving emetropia rest is the choice of uh, accurate intraocular lens power formula which has seen continued advances. While SRKT, a third generation formula has been used since ages, the newer generation formula like Barrett Universal 2, Hill RBF, Hegis Holade 2 and Keynes are gradually taking over. The newer generation formula take into consideration several ocular parameters like axial length, keratometry, wide to wide distance, anterior chamber depth which are accurately measured by optical biometer. Pupil dilation is essentially performed for grading cataract as well as preoperative fundus examination of every patient scheduled for cataract surgery. Contrary to this, there is limited information available regarding the influence of pupil dilation on various ocular parameters and hence on accuracy of different IOL power calculation formulae, especially the new, newer generation ones. Purpose of the study is to assess the changes in the intraocular parameters, that is axial length, keratometry, central corneal thickness, lens thickness, wide to wide, anterior chamber depth after pupillary dilation, and to assess the impact of pupil dilation on the IOL formulas like Barrett Universal 2, Hegis, Hill RBF, Holade 2, and Kane, and the SRKT. Study design is a prospective interventional study conducted in Department of Ophthalmology at Ames Raipur. Uh, inclusion criteria, the patients more than 40 years with senile cataract were included in the study. Exclusion criteria, previous ocular, uh, ocular surgery, pupil dilation less than 6 mm, ocular comorbidities like ocular injury, uveitis, retinal degeneration, dense cataract or poor fixation requiring ultrasound biometry, other type of cataracts like metabolic drug induced inflammatory history of contact lens used within last four weeks uh, in reference with a recent article published by Teshigwara et al the sample size was calculated to be 495 and this is an interim analysis of 220 patients methodology the patients meeting the inclusion criteria were enrolled into the study after obtaining written consent and visual acuity assessment is done using Snell and Star. Preliminary ocular examination is done to diagnose the age-related cataract by slit lamp biomicroscopy examination. IOL Master 500 was used for measuring the biometric variables like axial length, keratometry, anterior chamber depth, WTW before and after pupil dilation, and lens thickness and central corneal thickness were measured with A scan ultrasonography. Dilatation is done by installing one drop of tropicamide phenylephrine three times at an interval of 15 minutes. Second reading is taken 60 minutes after the installation of the first dilating drop. And the IOL power calculation was done for Barrett Universal, Hill RBF, Holade 2, Kane, uh, and SRKT formula based on the parameters acquired before and after dilation. Uh, our results that uh, influence of pupil dilation on biometric measures before and after dilation, we have observed that there is significant difference between anterior chamber depth, WTW, lens thickness and central corneal thickness before and after pupillary dilation 
Anterior chamber depth, WTW and CCT showed a significant increase post dilation. And lens thickness have significantly decreased after the dilation. And the impact was seen in the Hegis, Hill RBF and the Kane formulae that is uh, done without using lens thickness as a parameter. And uh, coming to the discussion, pupillary dilation is an important practice for the purpose of test and treatments in ophthalmology. The patients are normally scheduled for at least two visits before the day of operation due to the uncertainty about whether the use of dilating drops would affect the IOL power calculation. It has been observed that the anterior segment physiology may change after the metriatics. Optical biometry, that is IOL Master 500 users, measures the axial length along the visual axis of the eye, giving more accurate value. On the other hand, with dilated pupil, technical problems will arise with the fixation, leading to the measurement of optical axis in placement of visual axis, thus giving the erroneous results. So it is very important for us to evaluate the influence of pupil dilation in biometry measurement, proving the hypothesis that the pupillary dilation has no effect on IOL power calculation would not only reduce the steps of the preoperative cataract surgery process, but also save the time and traveling expenses for the patient. Uh, in our study, we have observed that there is significantly change of anterior chamber depth and lens thickness after the pupil dilation. This is because uh, as the ciliary muscle relax due to pupil dilation, the tension on the zonules increases, lens become thinner and anterior chamber depends. This was also seen in an uh, article by the Tashigawara et al. And the increase in WTW observed in our study was similar to uh, the study by Huang et al. Huang et al speculated that this is mostly because of the IOL master determines the limbus by taking a photograph of the eye, detecting the boundary between paler sclera and darker iris. Time is up. Uh, your time is up. Kindly conclude. Okay. okay. Uh, so, preoperative biometry is re regularly performed and uh, in the department in order to determine the most accurate power of the intraocular lens. And in our study of 220 eyes, we have seen that anterior chamber depth, lens thickness, WTW and CCT are influenced by pupil dilation and its impact were seen in fourth and newer generation formula which incorporates the variables, these variables, Hegis, Hill, RBF and Kane without lens thickness. On the other hand, the pupil dilation have no significant impact on the third generation formula using axial length and keratometry, most popularly the SRKT. Thank you. These are my references. Okay, thank you uh, for your presentation. So I would like to ask you a question, even though you are yes. not being marked. Yeah. Uh, what's the reason for change in white to white? We uh, can understand there is change in AC depth and other, but white to white. Sir, you were uh, saying something actually. IOL master, we have used IOL master 500 and it takes, uh, it is based on the image analysis and between, uh, after the pupillary dilation, the iris been uh, bunging and between the uh, paler sclera, it is better to identify after that and because of that, the results are altered. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. Okay, and now uh, since it's not been reported to me, is Dr. Sri Devi Nair present in the hall? Okay, she's not turned up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all the speakers. So, Would you like to present Dr. Manpreet on her behalf? We can just listen to the essay. You don't have, okay, fine. Yeah. Thank you. Finished. With that, we come to the end of this session and uh, I thank all the chairpersons and uh, judges for this, for this uh, the trouble and all the speakers for having presented such innovative papers. And uh, at the end, we would like to have a group photograph of the judges with the speakers. And whoever is present in the hall, please come up to the dais, please. <laughs>